We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is David Murren. He's a global forecaster and author of Breaking the Code of History, Lions Led by Lions, and Red Lightning. How are you today, David? Thanks for joining me. Really well, thanks, Tom. I'm out of my black t-shirt into a bit of summer color. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm still in the in the black t-shirt just for the, the sake of consistency. <laughs> yeah, well, you've always got to do just something a little different some way. <laughs> yeah. So David, you and I have spoken before about the conflicts around the world, for example, between Russia and Ukraine. But I'd like to start by asking if because of the interrelatedness of China and Russia and how, you know, how they have in many ways begun working more synergistically, does that set up the possibility for more conflicts around the world, not just centered in the Ukraine? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at sort of complex history, there seem to be periods when we go through long periods of peace where war is just unthinkable and then war starts and it spreads like a virus and then it becomes you know propagated from various theaters of conflict around usually two main protagonists and we're in that period and the best way to describe what i think drives that is you know i'm a big fan of the Kondratiev cycle we've talked about its influence on commodity inflation and this 56 year cycle that has like a heartbeat and it sort of goes three up and three down. Well, I'm really more and more coming to think about it in a different way in that it isn't inflation that is the primary driving mechanism. It's like a heartbeat that goes through human systems that makes them more entropic and more chaotic. And when that pulse is low at a low extent, that's when you tend to get peace and harmony. And as you move towards the top, the anti-entropic behavior triggers all sorts of violent actions and disorder in the system. And inflation is like your body's response to inflammation. It's the disorder coming out and the system's response. And war is the hallmark. So we have to ask ourselves where we are in our current cycle. And I was able to make the prediction that World War II three would start in 2022, two decades ago based on where that commodity surge was. At the end, I thought of it as commodity surge, inflation, but I'm now going to call it an entropic cycle. And the war with Russia is a war between NATO and Russia, with Ukraine in the middle, mm -hmm. and fighting it. But make no mistake, World War III started with the invasion of Ukraine. And the involvement of NATO forces is unbelievably high whether it's a few on the ground, weapons systems, intelligence targeting. And what fascinates me is we are effectively all in in this war. If Ukraine loses, we all lose. Our world becomes incredibly unstable. And so we've got this process where when you're all in via a proxy system like this, why would you only put your big toe in? Why would you give the Ukrainians not even enough to complete their offensive? And I think something that's been very alarming to watch is that obviously Britain has been leading the charge and Poland's been supportive of that, of giving Ukraine what it needs. And we led the charge with, for example, N-laws. We led the charge with high Mars. We led the charge with tanks via the challenges that opened the way for Leopards and, 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 and Abrams. We gave them storm shadows with 180 mile range that Biden was completely and utterly, you know, wouldn't do because he might attack Russia. Finally, the Americans might now give them long range ATCMs for high mass systems. Um, now they might even give them cluster bombs. But what's interesting is the Ukrainians started an offensive. They didn't have a proper combined arms capability, as in they didn't have the air power. And we forget combined arms means land and air power integrated in a type of warfare overcomes all obstacles with different weapons at different times in an integrated fire plan. They didn't have any air power, but they didn't even have any air defense because they'd lost all their S-300 missiles. They had about 100 batteries before the war, and obviously they've lost some since. But they've lost all their tubes at the end of April, which meant that the defense of Ukrainian cities was based around two Tet Patriot systems and NASAM systems and not enough of anything. And the reason why the Russians are pummeling the cities is it forced the Ukrainians 
to keep the air defense systems around their cities and not on the front line. Now, you'd think that NATO would have worked out there can be no offensive unless you at least create air neutrality over your combat zone. But it's very obvious that the night advantage of you know modern platforms when they use them briefly in the south of a Bradley or a Leopard that can fight at night was countered by a KA-52 helicopter with similar night vision. And so we just haven't given them the tools to complete the job. And I think what they did was they were at this tentative battle forming phase and they moved to a phase where they're moving to the front line of the first line of Russian defences, and they couldn't even get through the first line of defences. But their plan was to roll back the first line to get to the main second line, and then with a broad front, they could choose their moment of ingress. They didn't even get that far. Now, they've been smart, because they haven't stubbornly kept hammering away. When they realised it wasn't working, they backed off. We have to give them so many more pieces of equipment for this to work. And whilst we're waiting to give them equipment, the Ukrainians demonstrate their lack of equipment through the loss of their own people's lives, which is a horrible concept, which is then traded for, we need a new weapon system. But the Russians are adapting. And I take a very different view about what took place with the putsch. And essentially, people saying it's the beginning of the end and there's cracks. I completely disagree. I think the Russian army was moving towards a 1917 point. And when that process took place, and the spark was ignited with the Wagner Group, and it didn't spread to everyone else, that's really alarming to me because it means they're in a much more durable phase of their psychology than we gave them credit for. If you couldn't have started at that stage, well, now you've removed the, the sparks, which are the Wagner Group, you remove anyone who actually supported them. And as we found out with the, with the, with the, with the bombs against Hitler, the result is every single person who was against Hitler gets ferreted out. And after the bomb plot in the bunker, there were no more plots because there was no one left. They'd all joined the side to make their last stand. So I think we need to look at Russia as much more stable than we give it credit for, being reorganized. It'll, you know, the army will have been reformed. They will integrate effectively what wagon units they can. And essentially, it's a more coherent structure, which is now embedded behind defenses, and the Ukrainians don't have the equipment to winkle them out. And we should be alarmed at NATO's short-sightedness. And she would have noticed that. She notices that every time he hears Putin and Biden respond, his message over the pooch was, oh, don't do anything to inflame it because they've got nuclear weapons and we don't know whose hands they'll fall into. What we should have been was, shit, if you think they're vulnerable, push now. That's, that's how you win a war. And the same timid approach was when the threats of first nuclear weapons. The Biden regime is really is, is, is the root of this war as it evolves goes right the way back to Biden's feet. It happens with Afghanistan, with his route, which signaled time was right for Putin to move. It will signal she that the time is right. And he's not just losing his faculties through dementia, where he should be, you know, have the 25th Amendment served on him. He is fundamentally a man of exceptionally poor judgment before he became demented. The combination of poor judgment and dementia at a time like this, is just an accelerant to more conflict. And even if you go and look at the decisions around the next NATO leader, they allude to some really flawed decision-making. Yes, he doesn't like England because he's one-eighth British and one-eighth Irish, but he wants to be 100% Irish and not British. So he really has it in for Britain in every single way in terms of trade deals, which he should have struck a long time ago. He's had it in for Ben Wallace because... Ben has like, coerced America into action. He's resentful of that. But surely you want a strong head of NATO to stand up against what is obviously Putin and Xi, who are both misogynists. Whether we value women in the workplace, it's not the point. What projection to the character of our defense are we showing these predatory characters? And Ben Wallace was a stalwart. He wasn't very creative. He totally has ignored our defenses, which is not a big copy, which is a massive failure. But if you want someone on the other side and he said, I'll press the button if you do, I'd believe him. What you don't want is Van der Leyen, a failed defense minister who replaced rifles with broomsticks, completely started the, 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 the destruction of the, of the German defense capabilities, actually sitting there as the ultimate politician as head of NATO. It's the beginning of the end if she gets it. And yet, that's the person he's backing. So our biggest problem is not just the predators on our borders, it's absolutely the poor and weak judgment of, of this of this Biden administration. And it will see us it will see us greatly weakened and it will get worse 
as his term comes to a close. David, one of the things that you and I have discussed at length before is the difference between lateral and linear thinkers. So do you do you think that, let's say, Putin and Xi are lateral thinkers versus the, let's say, NATO and the West is mostly comprised of linear thinkers? I do, actually. I mean, Xi is without doubt a lateral thinker. And I think Putin is too, because he wouldn't have got where he was without it. Now, whether he's an informed version or a good version of it in terms of strategic capability, I think he's a, he's a tactical opportunist, not a great strategic thinker. I think Xi is a great thinker. I think he's truly formidable. And if I was to think of all of the leaders the West have faced in the, you know, since the Second First World War, I would make him by far the most dangerous by a, a, a squared factor. He's terrifying to me. He's balanced. He's considered. He's really ruthless. He understands how to wield total power. Um, he's probably slightly cautious too, so he wouldn't throw the dice as, as Putin did. Um, but there will come a time when he has to with his economic status. Whereas conversely, if you just go and look at the Biden administration, it's a personification of a linear thought process. Everything has caught them by surprise, from the stupidity of the evacuation in Afghanistan to forgetting the fact, you know, how we took Afghanistan with the Northern Alliance in the first place using telephones and bringing tribal leaders to our side with promises and bribes. And that's exactly how the Taliban took them back. And that's why we lost the country so quickly, but they didn't see that coming. They didn't see the, uh, what it really meant for us in the perception of these outside predators perceiving weakness. Absolutely no strategic vision whatsoever. And then basically, you know, all these poor Afghans being left to starve and die, they are the responsibility of Biden. And though he might say Trump set it in motion, he could have stopped it dead. So ultimately, it's his responsibility. Similarly, the total misjudgments with respect to Putin, the idea that economic sanctions would stop a monster like him, all of those things come from a linear misunderstanding as to how predators operate. And they're operating in boundaries and the predators are operating around the sides and not coming up underneath. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing the, the, the product of linear thinking. We're seeing similar linear thinking in, in within NATO, I'm afraid to say. I think it's anticipation of events and some of it are really not good. So, yes, we are a Western world at the end of our cycle, thoroughly linearized, plating predatory people with lateral mindsets. And, and uh, that's going to be a very rough period for us if we continue with that theme. You know, one of the things that you, you mentioned in, in your answer to my first question was that the world becomes a lot more unstable if Ukraine loses this war. You know... I'd like to delve into that a bit more if we can, David. Explain to us why that is. Because as I understand it, you know, Putin wants a handful of things and wants to be left alone. Doesn't want arms right on his border. So why does it become more unstable if that is the case? So Putin's vision before everything went wrong was to re-establish the Russian Soviet empire right up to the neck, which sits under Denmark, which is the giving space to Moscow, respect regional power. And Ukraine was but a stepping stone in that expansion. So let's imagine now, he may well be thinking, I need to hang on, but imagine the fortune of war changes in his favor. Imagine now that you know the West hasn't provided Ukraine with what it needs, that Russia continues to adapt and brings more soldiers online, that North Korea starts to provide weapon systems that they desperately need, and a year's time, Ukraine suddenly becomes Russian. The Ukrainian army has failed, but actually it isn't the Ukrainian army. NATO has failed. So NATO is now completely on its knees. Despite all its resources, it's failed to change an outcome. The border goes back to Poland. There's Russian forces on the border. How long do we think it will be before Russia rolls the next dice and that she accelerates his mindset of expansion into the second island chain? Pretty short, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. So I think the West is all in, in the support of Ukraine. We are now aligned, as in Ukraine's victory holds back the hordes. Ukraine's defeat accelerates the intervention of those hordes coming further west. 
and also the whole Asian basin being turned by aggression by China. And I don't think we're just talking about Taiwan anymore, because there's no scenario I can think of where the Chinese block t- blockade Taiwan and the Japanese don't come to help the Taiwanese. And when the Japanese are engaged, the Americans have to be engaged, and it just rolls like a deck of cards into an all-out conflict. And if you're a Chinese planner, you will have to assume that's how the cascade goes. So why not just start with a massive preemptive strike, which was the subject of red lightning, which I've span- expanded in my work as to the only way that China is, is running out of time. It either makes its move to beat the global hegemon and remove American power from the region, or it economically dies and demographically within the next six years. And it's also accelerated its economy to a wartime footing where basically it goes or it's bankrupt, like the Nazis did in 1939. And they have a window with, hegemon- with hegemonic weapons like hypersonic weapons that challenge the power base of America. And that window will be closed in two years with new weapon systems that are defensive. So it either happens now or not at all. Mm-hmm. She knows that. So his moment is the timing of weakness. And Biden's temerity and also his basic dementia only accelerates that moment. So it's we're, it's all in. And we're, if we're all in for, for, for literally the, the victory in Ukraine, then we need to give them the tools that we would want ourselves as NATO countries to fight a fully capable combined arms war. Anything short of that is is basically undermining our own future. So we're, we're, we're now in it. And we need to put all our resources in to help the Ukrainians, not partial resources. That includes, you know, air defense systems. And we and we had to take a terrible decision, which is, yes, we're weakening what we have by giving it to them. But if we don't give it to them and then they lose, it's even worse. So we need to increase our production of what we are giving. We need to go on a wartime footing for weapons production as the Russians have gone and the Chinese are accelerating. We seem to still think the world is still at peace. It isn't. Mm-hmm. You also said that World War III has, has already started. So what does, what does the rest of World War III look like? Is it an all-out war like in the past, or is it fought more, let's say, strategically and electronically? Well, I don't think it's a Cold War. I think um, a cold, the Cold War was quite unique in that we've been through two major wars in the space of 20 years. And at the end of it, the Western super-Christian empire split between those that were still predominantly Christian valued, even though they were less religious, and those that were atheist, of which communism had beat the Nazi socialists. And in effect, the empire split down the middle. And that standoff was between the USSR and the West. And that standoff comprised of men that had been to war, men that understood loss, men that understood risk, and their systems were then in decline. America wasn't quite, it sort of it, it, it carried on up, and they boated for a period. But from 75 onwards, they were moving into decline. And the combination meant there was reticence to fight, even though there was lots of standoff. The dynamic with China is completely different. It's a young society, and it's expansive, and it doesn't have any reticence like that. And it's facing an uber-old society in terms of the cycle of systems in the West, which we've just seen is completely linear and predictable and unable to make the right move at the right time. That is not a Cold War. That's just a hot war in the waiting. And that's what I think we've got. So I think, so let's just look at Ukraine. Let's just say the Ukrainians are successful. They're given the right weapons, and we have a miraculous counteroffensive. And they push the Russians right up to the border and push them out of Crimea. And what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean much, really, because it means they're not going to go any further into Russian territory. It means Russia's going to reconstitute itself over the next years to come and going to sit there, like, really pissed off with us, waiting for another go. The biggest issue is the Chinese, and the Chinese basically have to go within the next 18 months, or they will never be able to go again. So, and Because that's of their demographics. Right. Demographics, their economy, which has been focused on less an export-driven society as they made their initial capital in the past two decades, far more internally fueled and far more about a massive arms race. They'll go bankrupt if they do that. They have to, it's like a man who's running, who's going to trip over, and they keep like running to stop the tripping over. That's how you've got to think about a hegemon as it goes towards its challenge or, or a challenging hegemon to the hegemon. It's, it's not walking gently up to the line calmly, it's running, like almost falling and almost stumbling because it's having to expand massively 
It's having to create asymmetric advantage in some areas of its military, which is all new. And the whole lot looks quite chaotic. Think of Germany, you know, the build-up of the Nazis was actually a chaotic run towards challenge. When they went for their blitzkrieg, the main, all the generals said, are you mad? How do you take on the biggest army in Europe and Britain with its mechanized army? We must be mad for doing this. But the boldness of the move and the new tactics worked. That's the story of hegemonic challenge. It's not obvious until they roll the dice and boldness wins. So that's the mindset of China. And whether or not we win in Ukraine or not, he's still going to do it because he set up his whole system. And I believe he has the capability to eradicate both the Japanese Navy, the base of South Korea, and the American Navy inside the second island chain within 20 minutes. Predominantly the damage is done and another round for what's left. And then America's got to fight its way back in again. Now, there's some interesting pieces which have changed, and they do make me chuckle a bit. Because who would ever think that Finland and, and Sweden would become members of NATO? So the implications are far bigger than most people realize. So one is the Baltic becomes completely untenable to Russia. In Kaliningrad, this you know thorn in the side of NATO really dies a death. St. Petersburg is vulnerable, which has always been an ingress route into Moscow. And most importantly, a whole northern fleet that operates out of the Kola Peninsula that would be involved in sustained naval operations against the West is now vulnerable to the Finns driving across the border, stopping and closing one road which leads up to the north, and Western F-35s bombing every single naval base and ship in town so it can't operate. What that means is huge in that whatever Russian Navy ship is at sea may be combative for the period of its patrol, it won't be able to go back to its base in the northern Kola Peninsula. It's going to have to go all the way to Vladivostok and join the Chinese Navy. So within three months of conflict, you can assume that the Atlantic now becomes a safe Atlantic without Russian influence. And that releases all of the American Navy to be part of the fight back, which leads you back into the decision if you're a Chinese planner, you need a bigger preemptive strike. Your initial strike is how you level the playing field. So I think... Those conditions are interesting in that they make the Atlantic safer, but they also make the conditions for the red lightning free strike more. So any way which I look at it, we're standing into danger. And as a measure of this entropic process, I think inflation may have paused because of energy prices in America. And you know, obviously, America suffers from lower inflation levels than Europe uh, because of European energy. But there's another thing I think that we're missing here, and that is America's a more dynamic economy than Europe. And if you think of dynamism equating to anti-entropy against forces of change and challenge, which this inflation cycle represents, there's very little left in the tank for Europe. And the disorganization, as we talked about earlier, with, with, with Britain, for example, having the NHS in collapse and a much um, much more unhealthy workforce and constriction of the workforce feeds back into wage constriction and wage inflation. And we are seeing that and lower productivity. So each of those three places has a slightly different version of inflation. But the next piece of the surge is going to be some kind of supply constriction. And I think we've had the correction from the initial impulse. And we're now exposed to oil and gas and the grains starting to move higher. And that's a self-feeding process, even as demand collapses because our economies are being constrained by higher interest rates, the next surge is about supply. And I think the really terrible failure our linear governments have missed is that they should have been, as we talked about, creating taxes. They should have highlighted areas of supply constriction. And then they should be saying, companies that are involved in this space will get 10% tax discount for their work. So it's come for the time to governments to strategically direct the free markets through tax incentives operate into areas that we desperately need to, to fix and make, make sense of. So when we think about that supply side constriction, is that an, a deliberate constriction by other countries in the world? Is it a weather-based constriction? You know, where does that start to present itself? Well, as you said, you know, the Chinese are planning to cut two you know, rare metals to do with chip manufacturing because they have a monopoly on rare earths. So we've got to the stage where countries that have leverage to exporting unique products start to use it. So that's the first place. There's definitely been some kind of restriction out of China, which is more than COVID, in my opinion. 
which has really fueled the inflationary process. And if I'm right about the world bifurcating, which is the best, best version of this, and it bifurcates you know, into a Cold War dynamic, as we found, if you owned a Russian company when they invaded Ukraine, you lost the company. And I'm amazed at how many people still think that investing in China and Chinese assets are the way to go when you just look at the lesson of investing in Russia. But one day you wake up and it's gone. And I also think the Chinese are probably far more astute now is they're not investing in the same way overseas. It's because that investment's going to get cut off the same way. So if you, you know you if you sold your, your large playing field to the Chinese, you'll be getting it back in a couple of years when the guillotine comes down and you'll repossess it. So there is a sort of interesting game to be thought of. It works both ways. But as free Western investors, I think people involved in China really need to have their head checked. And I think it's a very linear process to think it's okay you know, on the basis of, well, you know, hang on, it's got lots of people and there's a large depth of economy I want to extrapolate from. And the ultimate person that is Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan, thinking as 1.2 billion people, I've got to hold that biggest market. Instead of thinking, even by going there, I weaken the edifice of unity in the Western world. And even by going there, I look stupid because I haven't worked out how hostile they are. So I, I, I mean, but that's all over the place. Apple, you can still have factories there. You know, we've had enough time to create alternative sources and we need to get on our bike and, and do it urgently because we're running out of time. Did Putin's energy war have its intended effect on Europe, David? You know, he, they were blessed with a very warm winter that I think helped ease a lot of those problems. But, you know, I wonder if that had the intended effect that he wanted. Well, I think the White House countered with the with the oil cap incredibly successfully. Um, and they have to be given credit for that because it literally depleted his you know his his, his treasury and also ablated you know some of the influences of the energy cycle. And so it was very different. It could have been much worse if if the White Biden White House hadn't have enacted such an effective cap process. And of course, there's always substitution where everyone goes mad trying to move it all around. And as you said, it was a mild winter, so he was unlucky. Imagine if he'd had the worst winter in a hundred years, he would have been vastly more successful. Mm -hmm. But what is interesting is with the amount of oil and gas that, that Europe buys, we are funding his war in Ukraine. There's a complete irony. Is that on the one side we pay for weapons to give to the Ukraine, on the other side we give them enough money to keep fighting. And at what stage do we realize that actually maybe we should turn our lights out so he starves, so he can't do it? And I think that sort of compromise at a time where this war is, as I mentioned, all in, fails to recognize the consequences of failure. And failure is you know, a really accelerated route to the collapse of democracy in our societies. It's nothing less than that. We are, we're not looking at an uncomfortable time in Iraq or, you know, a very difficult 20 year sort of war in Afghanistan where soldiers go out and, and some of them don't come back, but we change and continue our lives. We're looking at a process where our whole lives value systems are challenged. And strangely enough, if I wasn't in it and therefore invested in it, I would be the first to say, if you look at history and cities like Gomorrah and Solomon, you know, they were rotten, they were corrupt, they were you know, all the things that sort of biblically talked about, our society has become self, self-obsessed, self-centered, narcissistic, you know, linear, unable to perceive threats realistically beyond their front door. All of those things are hallmarks of a human society in late decay. And sadly, you know, although I predicted all of them, seeing them manifest in real terms, seeing Britain try to escape with a more lateral post-Brexit policy that might have been a beacon, for example, for the rest of Europe and America to follow and, and failed and fallen back into the hole, concerns me enormously. I mean, despite Britain and its Brexit you know, expansive uniqueness saving Ukraine, it's one of the things that no one ever talks about. Without Brexit, Ukraine would not be still be there. It would be Russian because the lateralness of Boris's mindset made him grasp and operate and his self-desire for, you know, correcting his political decline, all of those things were part of the Brexit process. I don't think it would have happened under any of circumstances. But the trouble is that evolution and revolution in thought and adaptation 
has been well and truly killed. And in that respect, COVID was remarkably successful if you're a Chinese planner, because the one thing you don't want is any element of the Western nations showing lateral, adaptive, expansive characteristics, because they can act as a beacon to lead the rather more sleepy nations with, with linear leadership around them and change outcomes. And nailing the Brexit evolution with COVID is one of their greatest successes, in my opinion, in terms of easing the path to a long-term victory for what they achieve, would like to achieve. It's not because I overemphasize Britain's importance. I think, actually, it's very clear to everyone, without Britain being bold, Ukraine wouldn't be there, would have changed the West already. It's just this lateral quality is quite borrowed. And if you went to Ukraine and its armed forces, they are fully adapted and naturalized because war has killed people who are predictable and linear and replace them with adaptable, bold people because war is the natural selective process for those qualities. So Ukraine is now the most adapted system in the Western world, by far, because that's what war does. And even the Russians are adapting slowly, sleepily. They're having to adapt to survive. And that's war's nature. It's a horrible observation, but we have used war to create the, like revolutions in adaptation through the winner that then has massive repercussions of growth after the war. It's very Darwinistic. But if once you accept that, you can also accept that systems that are linear, predictive, and slow become victim to ones that are expansive and adaptive. Mm -hmm. That's our vulnerability right now. You've also recently written about what you think has become Putin's Achilles heel. So I'd like to hear a bit more about that, if we could, David. So one of the things that Putin has failed to appreciate, Russia is quite unique in that unlike China with large demographics and the whole system seeking to find better governance, greater wealth, greater distribution of wealth and success because of this expansion, it's in a, if you were, didn't have she, you'd have someone else who would be doing it. But Russia actually demographically is the, the nation most in decline in the world. And what happened was it's a petro economy, energy economy. And as the contractual cycle restarted in 2000, that produced wealth that then gave Putin options. And Putin is a resentful, you know, I think he is lateral, but he's not a brilliant statistician. And if you look at his mindset in 2000, it was, we need to join the EU because we can't survive without you. And by 2008, when the commodity surge had started, he realized there were enough revenues from commodities. He didn't need the EU. And he became bold and belligerent. And that was the beginning of the, the route into Ukraine. So Russia is a commodity country with poor demographics. And what that means is, left alone, it wouldn't be expansive. With Putin and the wealth that the commodity cycle has given him, it's made him super aggressive. So when he went to war and has gone to war, he thinks that the Russia he leads is like the Russia that fought in the Second World War. It isn't. The demographics of the Second World War Russia were massive. They raised a million men a month into their army, lost half a million, still an extra half a million every, every month, got bigger and bigger and bigger. Whereas in Russia, their demographics are negative. So when you have high casualty ratios in that environment, there's a very quickly, there is a sort of social modification that can take place where society can't take the casualties. And at some stage, if this carries on, there will be a threshold where it breaks. Now, we have just seen from the latest pooch, they're not at that point. But another year of it, when they've lost a million people or a year and a half, and they're like two million people down, somewhere there is a threshold for all societies where they can't continue war. So in a strange way, the, the Ukrainian strategy around Bakhmut was to create a killing zone and the Ukrainians in defense have created killing zones that increase the casualty ratio of Russia to the point where it put them under stress. And I can see that process continuing if the Ukrainians can't make ground through the offensive. They'll continue to create these kill zones. Mm -hmm. So, and as they're finding, as has always been, attack is always far more expensive than defense. And, you know, I'm sure they're, one of the things they're doing right now is trying to work out how to actually make games in terrain that's surrounded by landmines, defensive structures and loitering munitions and drones that call in artillery. And how do you work through that to make ground with the least possible casualties? Because Ukraine's depth of personnel is far less. So you assume they'll be much smarter over and they have a much better casualty clearing process. So the ratio of death to wounded 
his bar lower as a result of that. So in short, his Achilles heel is Russian demographics. And if he continues to expend the population of his life as liberally as he does, that will be something that undermines him most acutely. Mm-hmm. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about a different type of risk, and that's the AI singularity. You know, there's basically this arms race going on around the world. So what does that mean, and who are the countries leading the charge? And do you think there should be an armistice to properly assess the risks before continuing? So you can guess who the main protagonists are. It's China and America. I mean, this hegemonic challenge of hegemon versus challenger has shaped why climate change hasn't been resolved because neither can afford to go to an alternative energy source because they're racing to use energy to compete with their economies to get defend and attack. Mm -hmm. And AI is really a game changer. So the Chinese have actually been right at the edge of that process and sometimes ahead until the recent Google computer with a 64 qubits capability, which they now claim beats the Chinese capability. Now, as you're probably aware of, quantum computing is not like linear computing. Quantum computing emulates the way the universe thinks. So it's believed that its ability to do material analysis, create new materials, because it thinks like the universe, is far more effective than our analog computing systems, even though they're supercomputers. So not only do they have the ability to crack a a Bitcoin chain, like a blockchain, which I've argued, these things will kill blockchain dead with their processing power, will break into anything. And the Chinese knew about this, so they created quantum communications with entanglement. Tangle will mean I can send you a photon, hold the other photon, and if this photon's in my hand, then I know it hasn't been touched, and we know we have integral communications. So, and very smartly, because all of the all of the wars that we have won in the West, from the Battle of Jutland to basically all of the big conflicts in the Second World War and subsequent to that, we have won through our superior signals intelligence, breaking the code of our enemies to anticipate where they are. The Chinese have made the analysis. And they know that they can't be the same person. So I think one of the things that concerns me again is we've always had signals intelligence superiority, and we can assume that we won't. That's scary point number one. Um, and from that, the development of AI in a, in a military construct is quite simply, you see it in Ukraine. You have all these multiple platforms and sensors on the battlefield. You have people with social media and Facebook saying, Russian tank outside my back door. You have another guy taking a leak who hears a noise and says, I think there's a tank. And they're all going into a system, and there's so many data pieces using an AI program to work out what's happening, whether the sensor in the air sees the tank at the end when the guy's having a leak. And then you can go and get your kill chain to operate quickly, allocate the system and kill the target. That's like the synthesis of data is huge. And as the kill chain shorten, so essentially I know a hypersonic weapon coming at you and I, we have 10 seconds to decide, is it real? What weapon to use? Launch it. Humans are going to be dropped out of the kill chain. So I can see this whole process with quantum computers and AI literally coming to the perfect storm. And I would assume that the first computers that reach sentient are military computers because they're the ones that have the biggest resources. And that's like a Terminator scenario because they then have essentially access to weapons and the decision to use them or not. If I look at human evolution, it's destructive creation. If you're a computer, destructive creation is actually a very illogical way for a computer to act. And it's going to conclude, A, you're a very weird race that destroys yourself to grow. And secondly, you might destroy me, so you're a threat to me. And do I preemptively remove it? So I think all of the things that we have brought up you know, with, with Arnie and the Terminator are actually extremely valid and very dangerous. And this arms race into the next level of conflict is feeding this change. Now, now, even if we get through the point where war doesn't happen, let's hope, and you know, AI doesn't become sentient with weapon systems and decide we're irritants, let's hope, then essentially something else is about to happen to us as a race. The human race originally were hunter-gatherers, and hunter-gatherers are all lateral because they have to keep adapting to survive. Nothing is ever the same. And although you have ways of hunting the prey, conditions might change. And so think of hunter-gatherers as highly adaptive, lateral humans. And then along came the agrarian cycle. And the agrarian cycle 
was predictable. You fed it, your animals every day, you did things regularly. And I think that's the architecture behind much more linear thinking and the linear hu humanity, which sort of extended to 70% of the population. The hunter-gatherers then became the warrior class and predominantly the leadership class, whose combat capability was linked to leadership, period. And we are on the cusp of another social revolution, and that is, if there is one thing, if you look at human qualities, linear predictable iteration is the domain of computers. It's the domain of robots. And the only thing left that they can't do is the thing that humans do that are lateral, which is creativity, connection of things that seem random into completely new things. So I think as agrarianism brought linearity into the human system, AI, robotics, is about to, over a period of generation, remove it. Now, it's quite frightening because think of the revolutions that go with that. You know, a whole sector of society that can be replaced, can't earn a living. Well, what are we going to do? Have a basic wage, you know, where people get to survive in it. We're going to have some huge social shifts. Even if we get through the hegemonic process, we're at another stage of evolution that we've got to go through. So there's so much happening to us as a race. There's so many layers of it. And I am actually, you know, I often get told you're so pessimistic. I am fundamentally optimistic that we will find somewhere ways to adapt and move through this. I am alarmed, though, that at this stage of the juncture, as we move into this tunnel of accelerated change, conflict, you know, climate change issues, we are led by the least capable governments in the West that think in such linear terms that are least able to make the adaptations required. And I can't see a way where the system will spontaneously change that, which means it's going to be changed by an external event or events that impact us disastrously and expose the current leadership as incapable of responding. And then the human system, somehow, as it did do with Churchill and Chamberlain, find a way to replace linear incompetency with a more lateral mindset that can create a different outcome. So I think whatever it is is going to get worse before it can get better, which is deeply concerning. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's, it's such a, a large puzzle to try to understand, to to try to think your way out of. And, you know, when, before we hit record here today, we were, we were kind of discussing the idea that we're heading to a wall with blinders on. And it seems like that in, in so many different facets of this, of this society, whether it's, whether it's war, whether it's energy policy, you know, how do you think that we, somehow incentivize leaders to become more lateral in their thinking to try to solve some of these problems a different way so that we can at least get some get some different ideas in the mix. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, we're at a much worse place than I would have anticipated we would be a few years ago, um, simply because the response of a linear group is more. So they put their foot on the accelerator of the car, they keep doing more of the same, and they literally hit the wall at like maximum speed. And let's look at Biden and his foreign policy. Everything he does makes the situation worse, makes the West weaker, and encourages predatory action from Xi, as it did do with Putin. That's him. Well, what's the outcome? Escalation and global conflict. In the UK, if you just look at Sunak as an epitome of a linear thinker and who believes that simple hard work should be rewarded by the universe, as was written in the newspaper, and he feels his covenant with the universe is broken because he's working really hard. Well, you're working hard, but it doesn't matter whether you work hard or not. If you've got the wrong model to actually make the change. And, the, and the really, the greatest leader we had was Reagan. Because Reagan understood that the only way to face the Soviets down was to stimulate the economy through tax breaks, make sure the Saudis rolled the barrel downhill with oil so their revenue stream in Russia decreased, and get high-tech weapons online en masse to face them down. Three points. It's all it took, in effect, to create a winning strategy. Mm -hmm. And that's what leadership should be. Leadership is about the top-down strategy of the key variables that make the biggest difference. It's not about fiddling downstairs in the basement because the pipe's leaking. 
when the roof's about to be blown off. And what, what, you know, watching Sunak is fascinating because I always described him. He's not a bad human being. Let's be honest, but he is completely deluded as to his suitability for the task. And he's supported by a linear, they call it the blob over here, but there is a whole linear group of people in the press that thought, you know, Mr. Mr. Linear would do it. And it's really clear that our debt situation is worse than ever. You know, more people employed by the NHS is not the solution because we don't heal people. Our population isn't responsible for their being overweight or health. And they just turn up and say, fix me, and the technology isn't there. And we're at this horrible spa where a lot of old people who are just expect to wait to die rather than, I think we should have a policy of live your life, and be productively and vital until death. That's a completely different concept, not retire and sit in God's waiting room, screwing around, like, you know, drawing on resources and not being productive. I want to be productive until my last breath. That's my image of my life. I don't want to go through a phase where somehow I'm retired, not productive, not contributing, because I think our self-identity comes from our contribution to society and whatever form that is. So I think we need to really change so much. And yet his answer is more people, more money and more problems. It's not going to work. And and everywhere I look, I mean, we're, we're stuck in this country with Tom Sawyer and the Treasury's concept that we raise taxes and we get more revenues. Well, we've seen and Laffer predicted you raise taxes and revenues go down because people don't work as hard. They basically don't. They defer their payments. And that doesn't work. Lower taxes, not only do you get people to be more mobile and rewarded, you attract other people's money and you don't have to do it through government subsidies anymore because your your revenue base increases. It's so clear. And yet the blindness and the continu- continuity of it is staggering. Mm-hmm. And it's almost as if, and this is quite an interesting esoteric concept, when a society loses productivity, and, you know, listeners will say, what does that mean? Well, we know it lost productivity because we started printing money. You only print money when your productivity and your creativity decrease and you compensate for going from, say, 3% GDP to one and a half. So you double your leverage and you look like you're at 3%. So that works for a while. And then basically, you productivity decreases a bit more. Creativity decreases a bit more. So now you're down to 1%. So now you need to go three times to get it up to 3%. And then finally, you end up, as you probably did around 2020, with 0.001%. And then you leverage it 40 times, and you sort of got 3%. Mm-hmm. And then you wonder why, oh, inflation appears. And inflation is the hallmark. It's like nature's signal within the human system to say, time to adapt, time to change, time to be more productive, time to get rid of those sequestered systems which have died on the tree, time for the new life and plant it. And that's the ultimate solution. It's a signal that systems have become old and they're tired. In this case, especially, not so much, I would say, in the 70s. The 70s, America was, in, and just think about it, America was as strong as it ever was into that 75 peak, and inflation almost choked it dead. And here we are on an inflationary path that I think won't stop until 2025, where rates will go in inflation to 20% and above. And we are incredibly weak in comparison. So I'm not sure how we survive that process. Our debt burdens will become absolutely unlivable. You know, you're going to see debt defaults, national debt defaults, because you can't afford to pay debt. There'll be moratoriums. So there's an awful lot of stuff that goes with this. And all I can say is that we need adaptive lateral leadership. At the moment, it's suffering the whack-a-mole concept where even the few people left are whacked over the head and can't speak. And that means that this wall is very close now. And that does alarm me. And I just hope that when we hit it, the car doesn't disintegrate totally and that it actually has a pretty good impact subframe that means that some people can get out and then actually rectify the situation. And hopefully that's what will happen. But it's going to be unpleasant before then. Well, you know, you bring up inflation and you mentioned earlier as well this three wave up, three wave down, pay wave kind of set up for inflation. So are we, do you think the, the world or, you know, separate this as you will, but how do you think about inflation going forward? And do you think that the, the analogous period at the end of the seventies where we had, or America had these really these three higher highs of inflation peaks is that a good 
proxy for how you see this well, going forward. This, this cycle has been slightly corrupted by money printing and you know, it's a, another sudden dynamic. So the first surge from 2000 into 2010 was pretty much as you would expect. But the deflationary period from 2010 to 2020 was pretty weak. And I think you can put that down to fundamentally weak underlying non-leverage growth in the Western world. And that made the corrective period pretty soggy if you were a commodity holder. And then obviously we had the low. And then from that low where oil was negative, we are now in what's called the C wave. So we've had A from 2000, 2010, B from 2010 to 2020, and that first surge was one of C. The correction we've had since the high when the war started in construction is the wave two. And I think that wave two is now bottoming and has already been bottomed. So we're now exposed to the beginning of the building process for the worst of all, which is the three of the C, and that process is very much one of commodity constriction because we're going to see inflation is going to kill demand because, you know, everyone's interest rate mortgage goes through the roof. So spending is just going to implode. So don't think, I can't imagine demand's going to do anything but decrease in our Western economies. So this is a supply constraint dynamic, which comes through Cold War bifurcation conflict. Um, and also lack of investment in producers, because that long 10-year period actually disincentivizes as often did, and it was particularly soggy. So that whole behind the curve in production investment is the root of the problem, mm -hmm. because it wasn't apparent for 10 years, and you can't get it online in time to stop this process. So I think, you know, and, and the process of commodity acceleration, there's a whole study which I'm doing, and it's really fascinating. It's to do with where did, so for example, the peak um, in World War I happen? And it happened in so roughly around um, 1917, which was just before Britain introduced convoys to counter U boats. So the ultimate peak that came with it was wartime constriction through merchant ships being sunk. And even when you look at the Second World War, you can see the second happy time being the, the, the peak of that commodity cycle in the Second World War. So you can see how wars dictate the sinking of shipping, obviously more demand for resources to put them into war material, and also if they're interdicted and sunk, that constriction gets worse and worse, pushing the price up of what you've got. Because for every every one you put into a tank, you've lost one at the bottom of the seabed. And I'm just doing this exhaustive study of the behavior of financial markets in World War I or World War II, and then the conclusions I'm going to draw about what could happen, you know, if the Chinese acted preemptively. What does it look like for the next three years? And what, what is, a, is, a, is an investment strategy that's appropriate? You know, David, I think one of the other ideas that comes up a lot is the idea of deglobalization, or, or as, as you said again before we started recording, this de, the idea of de-risking. What do you make of the, the countries that form the, the BRICS plus nations and their, their collective moves to having this this other trading currency do you do you see this as a long term threat to the US dollar or is there just too much trade at this point that has to happen in the dollar for years to come look i think the peak of the dollar happened last year and we are in the accelerated hegemonic slide a peak of the dollar for the recent years because obviously it was much higher sometime and and hegemonic currencies take a long time to implode if you look at sterling for example it's a long slide down the slope but what we're seeing is um, a new trading construct around China and Russia and its partners that seeks to exclude the use of the dollar. And that's very significant because the power of America's empire. So I would say Britain in the traditional form of empire was relatively benign because with a low demographic, if we went to a country we used a few people through administrative mechanisms with local administrators to control that country. And that meant we had to be very adaptive to the local customs because you couldn't change them. There weren't enough of us. And so relatively speaking, in the progression of control of other nations through empire, it was a relatively enlightened mechanism 
And when we relinquished control, we left those countries with all their infrastructure for self-rule to follow on, which is, I think, a huge thing. The American system goes even further than that. Its extraction of value comes through its currency, and it comes through the transaction of trade, which gives it unique qualities financially that then allows it to fund its military, which backs tax America and the freedom of the oceans and the leverage it holds. But what's happened as you move into late overextension and decline is you need the whole world to be functioning to draw money back into the system to work. And it's now so overextended that when you start to take 5% of it out or 10% out, that margin is going to have a huge impact because there is no extra marginal capacity to absorb it. So by the time China has taken out its block with Russia, and then that is really significant for America's financial well-being and therefore well-being to support its construct that's already overextended. So I think we, although normally hegemons take a long time to decline, this might be a faster decline than historically in this terminal phase we think it's going to be. So just looking at these BRIC countries, they all have different agendas. China is a block that excludes the dollar. India is different. India is very like Stalin's Soviet Union. It hates capitalism and it hates Nazi socialism. In the Indian form of nationalism doesn't really want to be with anyone. It's more democratic than it is communist. And it will probably join whatever alliance is formed against China as the last entity. Much as the Soviet Union was drawn in by external actions by the invasion, it didn't do it willingly. So let's just put them, and what they're doing is that they are understandably playing the great game of a sort of the rising hegemon behind China. How does it put itself in a position where it doesn't fight initially, and basically it emerges from the ashes as America emerged behind Britain? That's the great play for India. Um, South Africa is different. It's led by a kleptocracy of note that's literally drawn the wealth from the country and mismanaged it to the point of bankruptcy. And, the, and they've always been orientated with China and Russia because the struggle against apartheid was based on that reason. And then they were open to any bribes possible for influence. And their ultimate trading part is, they said, the tip of Africa, and they control the trade route around the, around the tip of Africa. That is strategically something the West better wake up to. And I think there's a good case for the, the, the Western Cape to succeed, in effect, from a breaking down um, central South Africa, if necessary, to secure the tip of Africa. So, and they are really on the cusp of, of a social breakdown of note. And you can expect that currency to keep disappearing like the Turkish lira. The Brazilians are sort of interesting, you know, because they're different. They're our powerhouse. They're again poorly led. And, you know, they're a bit like finger up at America. But I do think ultimately Southern America is well and truly in the sphere of control of Northern of America. It is too far away for the Chinese to project power to. So whatever machinations in peacetime, in the end, that area will fall in line, including Argentina, you know, with an initial struggle to eject the Chinese influence and the bases around the Cape of Horn, which they have increasingly done. Again, knowing if they block the Panama Canal and they fight the transit point, the Americans can't get their ships around to the Pacific very easily to reinforce their fleet in the, in the West Coast. So each one of those bricks has a slightly different agenda in thumbing up to America. Some of them, Russia and China, will be permanent enemies forevermore. South Africa still sits in the Western sphere of influence if you pull the triggers, and that's at the close of revolution. Brazil, you know, is independent until it isn't, just because it's outside the Chinese physical military sphere of influence. So they all have different agendas and under different conditions as conflict potentially increases, they're forced to make different decisions, if that makes sense. So do you think that this, in some ways, you know, if they do cooperate a little bit more, do you think that this gives them some ability to escape the inflation that the West is experiencing due to these, these higher prices of commodities and that trickle down effect through all those products? Okay, so um, South Africa has gold, you know, some gold, but it's not a big commodity producer anymore. It doesn't produce enough. And it's so poorly managed. Um, India is a high growth country, so you avoid stagflation in any high growth environment. 
as long as they keep growing and at a stage when there's natural entrepreneurial growth, they'll probably be better off than most. Um, and Latin America, a mixture. Not quite sure where that sits. Um, so if you're a pure commodity producer like Saudi Arabia, inflation isn't an issue for you. It is an issue in Russia because you're a commodity producer, although you're capped at your sale prices. So, But if you're a pure um, importer like Japan, it scares the crap out of you because in China's minimal growth, despite multiple leverage, and it has massive imported inflation because it needs resources to make it work. So everyone sits on a spectrum of different behavior. The only way to counter this, if you're you know, an average European economy or your Japan, is to turbocharge your growth so that you might have 8% inflation and you need to get to like 8% growth because otherwise you are going backwards in real terms. And that's what Liz Truss pointed out quite correctly, that the only real way of managing sustained inflation is accelerating growth through productivity and innovation rather than any other measure and opening the supply chains to remove supply constriction. What a concept. <laughs> you know, it's a rocket science, isn't it, to many people? Mm -hmm. And that couldn't work, even though it worked for Reagan and the Lafa curve. But you see, I, I've often thought about why is something that is so obvious so hard for people to accept? Because what they're using is an overriding concept, the tax is punitive, and it's designed to level the playing field between those that have and don't have. And so their construct is high taxes make social equality, but they don't see what you do is destroy the revenue earners. And when you remove the revenue earners, there is no equality to redistribute. And that's why we have this constant process of the denial that lower taxes produces high revenue is socially acceptable. And yet we've created a process where through money printing, asset prices have gone through the roof. And the few groups of people who are wealthy create the wealthiest group of people almost in history through the printing of money. And if you had assets, they all go up. If you didn't have assets, you're just left behind. Mm -hmm. So you know, these people like Bill Gates, anyone that benefited from that process are actually the recipients of money printing, printing policy. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the rising interest rate environment you know, around the world that we've seen to, to fight this inflation has popped the doomsday bubble, as you have coined it, without having the acute symptoms present themselves quite yet, or, well, or so fully, well, maybe maybe that's a better way to say it. Okay, so let's look at you know three indices in America. Let's look at the NASDAQ, which fell, and then its recovery is about 60% of the fall. And obviously it contains AI stories and unique processes. And it's very much the... The focus on Britain, America's creativity is more than enough to compensate for this pause. And then you go and look at the S&P and it's a similar version, just a little less of a correction. But then you walk over and you look at the Russell 2000, not the body of America. And that thing looks screwed because essentially it's wave two is flat. It just can't get itself off this bumping board thing at the bottom. And the reality for the American economy is the Russell 2000. And when you go and look at indices and you look at narrow indices, look in the FTSE, you know, the, the FTSE 100 versus the 250. The 250 is like the Russell 2000. It's just rogered. It looks like a dead man waiting to be kicked. Whereas, you know, because of the, some of the smaller, narrow, big stocks in, in narrow indices have different dynamics. So I think we have to be, if we're looking for a reflection of what our real economy is doing, look at those larger indices like the Russell 2000, the FTSE 250. It'll give you a better indication of the real economy. And the bellwether doesn't look good. Well, even if you take the, let's say, the top five, Apple, NVIDIA, those types of companies out of the NASDAQ, that that concentration makes up for something like 90 plus percent of the of the That's, gain back already. That absolutely. concentration in those, you know, handful of companies is is not a good symptom of the overall health of that indice. And, and and as they always say, you know, breadth is a, is, is a process of a, a healthy rally and narrowness of advance is a dangerous sign. But there's something else I think happening that's concentrating that money. We are going through a banking crisis, which is terminal in that um, if I'm right about bonds, they, you know, their first drop was we got that right. We're in some kind of pause. We may even have a reflex pop. But this is wave two. 
And there is another wave where bonds really accelerate lower. And with that acceleration, there are alarm bells ringing because the reason why these banks are in such a dire state is because the central bank said, you've got to hold 25% in long-term assets. So they all bought bonds at the highest and they all got absolutely rogered and they funded them short term and they funded them through their deposits. Then rates went up. Then the depositors left because they said, give me some money. And the next thing is if they were marked to market, at least half of America's banks are bankrupt. And it's only by sleight of hand they're still operating. Now, if you destroy your banking system, you destroy any process of supporting your businesses and leverage. And I think we're in sort of a pause about this because bonds are more likely to go up for a period in the correction they are down, even though inflation is just creepingly not going down. Somewhere in this point when the commodity prices start to surge, all hell will be let loose. And, you know, there's only a small window for this reflex rally, which is a more yield curve inversion. And then I think actually we're going to have something which is a debt crisis, because if rates keep going up, as I expect them to do in response to this endemic inflation process, you can only go so far. We're very close to those limits. So, you know, you've got a banking sector, which I think is deeply vulnerable. You've got obviously a few stocks which are creative and holding everyone else up. You've got the Russell 2000, which looks like it's all terminal and just waiting to truly drop a shoe. So I think it's, it's the doomsday bubble has burst. Inflation has killed it. But there are illusions that make it look like, as often happens, the wave two is always about, oh, it's a resumption of the trend. Oh, that was just a dip and I'm you know, buying dips and it'll go to new highs. And now if that starts to fail in reverse direction, now you've got people go, oh, hang on a second. Then you get back to the lows of the one, and then essentially things start to really crack. Mm -hmm. So I think we're in that scenario. And the result is something else, which is a very low volatility market environment. Really quite sleepy, I have to say. I mean, some of the, the things I think are kind of interesting, we're running long-term shorts in the dollar with wide stops to just let them, because that trend seems to be building, even though it's horribly like watching paint dry. I think gold and silver are in, in good shape to really start to test their highs. And Bitcoin in the crypto sector is probably the most dynamic looking of them all at the moment in terms of where do you want to place bets that produce alpha. I think that they are starting to you know, pick the low very successfully. And these things are moving. And they should be part of a safe haven portfolio without doubt. And I think Bitcoin can easily go to 100 in this search. So you know, equity like upside. You know, you, you mentioned that acceleration of the downside in bonds. Do you think that comes in conjunction with, you know, massive money printing that kind of comes around this this next, let's say, whatever crisis presents itself? Well, I I think we're kind of stuffed, actually, from money printing, simply because it's much more likely to be this inflation surge, which was meant to be temporary, is not temporary. And basically, it has another surge with commodity input prices going up and also the wage inflation spiral accelerating. And the net combination is you just look at your bonds and you think your, your negative real return is so bad that they just got to puke to get great yields to match. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be challenging because you know that'll kill the stock market, it'll kill just about everything, mortgage rates, commercial property, and you know how far away we're at? We still haven't finished the wave two, and I can see the wave two lasting for possibly another three months as long as inflation doesn't suddenly jump. I can see incremental inflation still not basically affecting that surge as long as you stay above certain price levels because people will be saying, well, it's just a delayed effect and we're getting ahead of the delay. Mm -hmm. But I think the simple reality is inflation is going to keep moving over time, horribly. It's like a virus you can't stop because it changes people's behaviors. People start putting prices up, waste spirals increase, and then suddenly you get this another supply shock that you didn't see. Like OPEC. I mean, OPEC could easily crank down supply because they're determined to increase prices. And they did it, they've done it once before, and not much happened. And that's probably to do, I think, America. It's sold its strategic reserves. So America is now in line to replenish its strategic reserves. So instead of a net seller, there's a net buying process coming on. So I think, you know, we've got to watch for those things. And just because it's gone sideways and it's like watching paint dry day after day with narrow overlapping ranges, doesn't mean this thing suddenly doesn't change direction. And I always encourage my um, clients and investors, at times like this, you have to keep your powder dry. 
risk a little, but be alert to change because most people will go to sleep before the change and that's where the greatest returns are. Mm -hmm. uh, and make sure you're pointing in the right direction at all times. You know, as part of that, David, can you explain to us a little bit, maybe give us an overview of what the ratchet risk model is and how it works and if it works well in the metals markets? Look, so the whole way that we I take risk is um, I use price models to determine all of the decisions. They do tend to fit into my worldview, which is generated with the five stages of empire model and other social theories. So I find very little things that conflict that I would advise. But at the moment, they're all very aligned. So I would look at a long-term pattern in, for example, gold. I would then look at medium and short-term patterns. And what I really want to do is I want to enter something that short-term gives me a $20 risk that I see as a $1,000 trade. Mm -hmm. And that's to do with understanding how short-term patterns fit within bigger-term patterns. So I risk a little to make a lot and a multiplicity. And some, and it goes through different phases. Gold and silver are probably over the past four years one of the most consistent earners in terms of the pattern generation provided. But actually, um, bonds, for example, which are German bonds, are unbelievable using my system because you get these little tight entry points and then literally the thing just disappears 20 times. So you 10 or 20 times returns because it's very precise in the way it stops and it just disappears in the right direction. Whereas if you go and look at a currency like the euro versus sterling, it has overlapping prices. And yes, I want to predict the direction because there are other ramifications, but actually I just wouldn't trade it because it goes up and down and you risk one unit and now you're two units of profit and you go, oh, you're one unit of profit. And there's no dynamism in that process and it uses your capital and your emotional capital without reward. So in gold, it's all about finding the right lows. And we got the recent low in the past week or so precisely within $4. And, you know, if you weren't long, that was your option. Now you can be re ready for the next one. Not buying the breaks upwards or not buying momentum. That's not my style. I buy into counter trend moves with precision that then evolve and move to the next, the next bigger trend. And that ratio system is incredibly alpha generative. So do you do you have any, let's say, any any long-term targets for gold and silver? Do you have any idea about I do, I do, they're huge. I mean, obviously we have to get through 2100 mm -hmm. because you know the old highs, but we're going to do that. We'll be a surprise at that. I think I just keep thinking if we have two Olympic swimming pools worth of gold, and we have all that printed money that had to get into it because we are going to go back to a gold standard. And we're talking about, you know, when it really gets going, I think we do have numbers that, you know, are embarrassing numbers to talk about. Mm -hmm. The multiplicity of those numbers is huge. And if you're in, you know, gold stocks, that's where you want super multiplicity. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, could I see gold at 5,000 by 25, 27? Yes, you could. Mm -hmm. I could see it much higher than that, actually. Because the, the, if this whole confluence of events starts to come towards us, it's going to be really unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And certainly you'll get upside because the dollar is going to go lower. We know that. Certainly you get upside because inflation is going to kick in and bonds are not going to be a safe haven for a time if I'm right about it. So it's just a matter of how. And I'm also very worried at some stage you come on and take your gold off you because it'll be using it for something. So there's not just about getting the direction, it's understanding the previous times when the government made the decision that your gold is their gold. Um, so there's a few hurdles, and that's what we do, is take each step at a time, but mindful of you know, how the, the, the path has operated before and what governments have done when they needed something from their people. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to the idea of, of being alert to, to changes. Yeah, and also it really does help. This whole K-Wave cycle does seem to overlay and work. And also the details of price. Then also understanding, you know, on the basis of my five stages of empire model, we are just walking into war. We're at war. Polarization, for example. I don't know whether you've been into an airport where there are lots of Russians, but I don't feel comfortable because whether they're Russians outside Russia or Russia having a holiday from Russia, they are now on the other side of a war that we're involved with. And I can feel that polarization. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't really want to interact with them. And I'm always, I've traveled a lot around Russia. They're the other side of the coin. And I can feel that human influence of polarization. 
I describe it as the walking towards war where we dehumanize our opposition. We see them as not the same of us, which is how we make the jump to be able to kill each other. I can feel yeah. that in myself. <laughs> and that's alarming because it must be all the way all over the place. So, and yes, I feel sorry for Russians who fled who don't agree with Putin, but they were actually part of Putin's system before they fled. They did benefit from the regime he built. And so there's all sorts of parts of that which concern me a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but all I know is the world is is moving down routes and paths which I anticipated 20 years ago and that alarms me because I define those routes and we're walking them and um, I don't want to seem overly pessimistic I don't think this is the end of the world but it might well be the end of the society that we understand as ours if we don't take better measures mm -hmm. it, it has all sorts of ramifications where you know, where we, if you're if you're Ukrainian, this war has changed their lives, but it hasn't changed our lives because it's blighted them. But we might be the subject of one of these blights in Western society, and history tells us that you need to be pretty tough. I watched a something I thought was really really alarming. Actually, you won't have seen it, but it was on BBC. It was a documentary of the RAF organisation that was sent for the evacuation of Kabul, and. I am a great believer in being connected and authentic to our emotions and feeling them and expressing them. But I also come from a generation, and I did things when I was younger, that were pretty tough living in a jungle. And I was always you know, relatively the son of a generation that went to war. And I can feel that in my construct. But I was listening to people that were in tears at what they'd seen. And I understand how distressing to see so many people desperate to get out and the situation where the, Tal Tal the Taliban were chasing them. Don't get, me, don't get me wrong, I don't underestimate that. But actually, for our soldiers to be so emotional over something that wasn't, my company was at war, I saw my friend blown apart, you know, I saw half my company die, and I am truly traumatized. I get that trauma. You know, that trauma deserves recognition. But it was like the threshold at which emotions were shown relation relating to external levels of trauma. And I must admit, again, if I was Russian or Putin or Xi, and I watched those programs, I would be interpreting it not as strong, tough people doing what they have to do, but actually a soft society, over-emotionalized, and finding it really hard to deal with difficult things, because we are a soft society. Mm -hmm. And I find that deeply concerning at this time, because... There are no soft Ukrainians anymore because they've had to harden up. They were pretty much tougher than we were in the first place. But we, we are not prepared for this challenge. If, imagine if there's any Western country going through Ukraine. They were, we, none of us would have survived it very well at all. Um, well, I think so, that the point you make about polarization is, is very important because it's so easy to identify somebody that you've never met as evil or as the other and then that that removes the the face and the and the personality and the humanity from that person when you know very likely they're they're a person just like you and I that wants you know to to live in a in a clean world and and have a future for themselves and their children and and the, and the real tragedy of war is that you and I are on the opposite side in peace we're able to have this conversation in war I have to dehumanize you to kill you you have to dehumanize me to kill you we have the same values Mm -hmm. The difference is you're led by people with different agendas. And the sad thing about dictatorships like Putin is one man is responsible for the deaths of you know, 250,000 Russians plus, and you've got to think two-thirds of that of the Ukrainians. That's coming onto a battle the size of Stalingrad. And I think that's the thing that people miss. This is not some podunk localized war. This is a war on a most enormous scale taking place on our watch that equates to the, the size of the battle around Stalingrad and the size of the losses. That's the third biggest battle in history. Mm -hmm. It's huge. And sometimes I can't get my head around it. You know, the Ukrainians have built themselves 12 assault brigades, of which three have been given, engaged somewhere around Bakhmut, I suggest, and one of them perhaps in the south. That's three, that's four divisions. But that's nothing compared to the size of the forces in the Second World War where the Russians yielded. And they need more. They need so much more than what they've been given. And I feel ashamed 
that we haven't stepped up to the plate. We haven't given them enough air defense systems to defend their whole country and their front lines. Mm-hmm. And we haven't thought about how they're going to win. Thinking, not how the Ukrainians going to just have given some toys. It should be, how would we win that war? What do we need? And we need every single weapon at our disposal to break those defenses, to make decisive ingress, to break you know, the Russian will. So you get behind them and you see their forces collapse and create a disadvantage outcome. That is the best way to deter Xi from an action he may be concerned about. And I don't think he's, I think he's not like Hitler. Hitler was a very bold man that fought in the First World War in the trenches, was brave. I think Xi is a more cautious man and he's facing a very difficult decision, which is to use new weapons that have never been proven in battle, or to not use them and accept the gradual demise of his designs to put China on the you know, the premier hegemon in the map. Mm-hmm. And I think that balance probably is his most difficult decision, whereas Hitler would have said, roll the dice, let's do it. He's got to have an awful lot of internal pressures that that four-year plan is going to an end before he does do it. But anything that we do that weakens his perception of our response only encourages him and emboldens him. So there's a, there's a battle of Xi's mind that we need to be very mindful of. And Biden's whole posture around being timid is actually accelerating his furry dice moment when he rolls them, not the other way around. And on the lines would be another sign of just, you know, how we don't take defense seriously. So it's a question of, and I put this to, to people that, 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 how do you feel when you go toe to toe in a street with a guy who looks like a total thug and his muscles are bulging and his eyes are like staring. You look at him and go, oh, my God, like, this is going to be really bad. Get me out of here. But then you turn around and it's a little old four foot two lady who's saying, I wondered if you could stop that. And completely different outcome. So it's human playground dynamics have an enormous impact in the world of geopolitics in personal estimations of actions. Mm-hmm. And again, we are not looking in the mirror to look at the way we project our image. Like, Jake Sullivan's role as security advisor has been delayed, insipid, poor. I mean, he averted a proper use of a nuclear weapon before Christmas when the, you know, the whole advances are taking place by finally saying, if you drop a nuclear weapon, we'll conventionally strike every aspect of Russian society, military society, such that your only response is a nuclear weapon, which shoved the whole system back onto the ladder of mutually assured destruction. If I'd have been the security advisor, I would have said it before the war started. I would have made it very clear to me, if you use your escalate to de-escalate policy and use a single nuclear in Ukraine, we will reciprocate in kind to the point of destruction of Soviet forces. And all you're left to do is use a nuclear weapon against us, and then we'll all die. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those are the sort of messaging we're missing. Well, David, I I appreciate you giving us a very pragmatic look from, from your point of view at the world. I think you know, looking at things accurately versus just, you know, clouding over it or, or looking at it with our blinders on, like we were talking about earlier, is far more valuable. Is there anything else you'd like to bring up before we wrap up for today? Look, I would just say, you know, I know it's really hard and our natural process is not to look at very difficult topics. And we all want to do that. Denial is a lovely human quality. Put the rose-colored glasses on. Mm-hmm. And, and I think the message I would say is, is this is about being courageous enough to look at where we are so that you have an accurate evaluation of where we are. And therefore, from that point, it all gets better. Because if you do it early enough, you still have choices in how you preempt it, choices to change it. And then you can create better outcomes. So I can't paint an optimistic picture for the way the world is operating at the moment. But I can paint an optimistic picture if we all take a deep breath and realize it, and then say, what are we going to do about it? Yeah, I think exactly. that's the most important message. Instead of saying, oh, what do we do? We can't have an influence. We can. The beautiful thing about democracy is every time we have a conversation with our friends, they have another conversation, we have another conversation. And the, the thing that separated Homo sapiens sapiens from Neanderthals, we believe, is if a Neanderthal had an invention, like a stone, like a spear thrower, they never talked outside their tribe, and the spear thrower invention stayed in that tribe. Mm-hmm. The Homo sapiens sapiens 
If one of us found a spear thrower on fire, it spread through all the other tribes because of the way we communicate it. And that's essentially how we work. So we have to use and recognize that this voice that we all feel suppressed and doesn't count, it really matters. And actually starting to talk about it, starting to be aware of it, is our best defense against it. Not being too scared to talk or being suppressed by agencies within our society that don't want us to think that way. So I think it's all up to us. It is in our hands. And the reason why I'm public about this stuff is not because I like the sound of my own voice, because I truly believe that's the miracle of democracy, the freedom of speech, to be bold, to recognize problems. And that's 51% of the, of the advance, because once you do that, you're looking for solutions. Mm-hmm. And so I would encourage everyone to think that way. And if this is an engaging conversation that is concerning, instead of turning the box off and saying, have a beer, go and talk to your friends about it. And then from there, create the cascade of change and the demand for change. And the most inspirational story I can think of, which is very relevant to this, is that um, if you look at the history of the RAF, it started as a Royal Auxiliary Flying Corps, the Naval Flying Corps, and the RFA, which is an Army Flying Corps. And in 1918, it was built by Trencher to amalgamate the two into the RAF. And he was very aware of the fact that they might get reabsorbed back into these two primary services of the Navy and the Army. So he wanted to create this concept that the bomber would always get through. The strategic bomber would always get through, and there's nothing you could do. And the real issue is, do you have more bombers than your enemy? And this carried on into the 20s and the mid-30s. And then there was this movement in British society that said, hang on a second, you need to defend us against those bombers. And the air ministry was the bomber always gets through mindset. And they were forced by public opinion to create fighter command. And that's where Hugh Trenchard came along. And he created this incredibly innovative system of radar and and depth and observation and how to defend against bombers. And it was public opinion that drove that change, not government. And I think in that lesson is a lesson that our freedom of speech, our communication over drinks with our friends about our concerns, creates cascades that create public demand, that force people in office against their will to make changes. And that's something we should all bear in mind. It's on our shoulders to be part of that process. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, you know, the idea that having these conversations is important, A, but also exposing people to different ideas that have a different perspective can come up with different solutions, right? Yeah, and, and we, we talked earlier, and, and I maybe mean, think there's a COVID inquiry in the UK, and it has all the hallmarks of a complete cover-up. And I wrote a piece about it, and it was basically, let's just look at what happened to us as a, a study of governance gone wrong. We didn't have a pre-pandemic plan. We didn't know how to deal with this type of pandemic. And so we were, two things happened to our government. They forgot about the old people and they were bounced into some lockdown to protect the old people. But the other thing was China created, I think, intentionally this persona that if you're disciplined like us and you lock down, you can kill this thing dead, which I think was part of their strategy to turn a highly transmissible, low lethality, manipulated virus into a biological economic weapon that increased our debt ratios. Anyway, they took a hook, line and sinker. They adopted lockdown. And... There was no mechanism whereby someone who is a think tank and natural thinking is advising the government outside the group thing, is how well is that lockdown process going? Is it, well, is it going well? Is the evidence really there for, oh look, 4,000 people who are educated signed the Barrington Declaration. I wonder how they're thinking about that. Mm-hmm. And public calls will say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And I think the public is like a giant thought engine and the governments need to actually have a hotline that processes ideas and distills the best ones as an adaptive process that's broader than the few people in government. So you have the think tank and you have the population. And very quickly, they would have turned around and said, that didn't work so well, transmitted completely differently. It's obviously airborne and lockdowns don't operate, so we're not going to do that again. But what they did was they ignored any source of information, they doubled down on it, and they kept doing even more damage. And even by the fourth variant of Omicron, which was now clearly not lethal, because you can trust the, the South African feedback group in medicine because they're so good. We were still determined to try a lockdown strategy. Now, that is a really good example of a failed linear form of government and leadership. And all the Western countries did it apart from Sweden. Mm-hmm. So the lesson is not enough lateral thought, 
not enough quality of input at the first, not enough feedback loops to go and look back and say, is this working? Well, you know, and, and I understand, as we talked about, why having created the policy, you might try and create fear to implement the policy. But you've still got to have something separate from that that's monitoring the process to say, what if we're wrong in our first judgment? And we have to change the way we govern ourselves because that's the process that war engenders, a process of action, feedback, adaptation. And that's what's missing across the Western world right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I couldn't have said it better myself there, David. I think that's a great, great way to wrap up. Of course, on Twitter at Global Forecaster and davidmurin.co.uk, right? Absolutely. And if you're interested in the things that I'm talking about, the different levels you'll find, you'll find all of our media stuff that's open to the public there. But if you're really interested in the things I've talked about, I have a lot more research and detail. And if you subscribe to Murray Nations, not only do you start to understand why I think the way I do, but you'll understand and create the ability to start predicting and anticipating yourself. It's not more than a newspaper a day, and it's going to educate you about how the world really works, because you can then actually see how these changes unfold. And most of our stuff predicts things you'll read in the paper months later. So if you want to get ahead of the curve, I strongly recommend you actually access it. It will change the way you think about the world, and that's what it's designed to do. Mm -hmm. Excellent, David. Thanks so much for your time today. It's always a pleasure, Tom. Lovely to be on your show. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.